joining us. I'm Norma Ritz Johnson, Lubbock Chamber of Commerce Executive Vice President. We're going to go ahead and get started in just a moment as we wait for a few more people to potentially join into the meeting room. Just a reminder to please keep your microphones muted during today's meeting to avoid any feedback or noise interruptions. And as a reminder to show your support for local businesses, don't forget if you're doing business with a local business, please be sure to support them in some way on social media using the hashtag LBK Local Challenge. It could be a place you've ordered a meal from, a local business who is helping out during the crisis in some way, or just a business that you support in general or that you miss doing business with in this current situation. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today for an important update from Texas Comptroller Glenn Hager. We may have time after the comptroller has concluded for a few questions that have been both submitted in advance, but also if you have a question that comes up, please type any questions in the Zoom chat function. And if we can't get to them, we'll be sure to forward those to his staff or to our state legislative staff. I'd also like to thank uh, Senator Charles Perry and state representatives John Frulo and Dustin Burroughs, who I know we're going to try to join us this afternoon. And now, without any further ado, I'll turn things over to Comptroller Hager. Mr. Comptroller, thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to your update. Thank you, Norman. I wish I could be with you in Lubbock today. I'd rather do that than all of us being at home, but you know, here are the times that we find ourselves in. Well, I'll just start with a couple of, obviously, uh, kind of introdu introductory remarks, and then happy to answer any kind of question. I know that we've got some, some submitted questions, and then it opened up to questions if we have time for everyone else. If you uh, kind of go back to February, which seems like to me and my staff and probably much of you that are that are on this call is that that seems almost like a thousand years ago, um, even though it was literally just a few weeks ago. But if you go back to February, tech's economy was still strong. We were leading the nation in job growth. Uh, we had about 50,000 job gains in February. Our sales tax receipts were continuing to be strong and actually outpacing slightly what we had anticipated when we guess gave our last le revenue estimate up, give that to the legislature last October. And so obviously things took a drastic turn as we all know there in March and Texas unfortunately has a uh, double face of headwinds at, at, our, at our sales right now in part because you have the uh, low prices in oil which uh, when Saudi made their announcement that they were going to increase production that gave me great pause and concern and I was reaching out to my staff that weekend that I was very concerned that that in itself was going to cause potentially some type of national and or global recession, maybe mild, but some type of recession. And then we fast forward just a few days and unfortunately the pandemic started to be spread here in, in the United States and in Texas and we all started going to social distancing, which in the first few days there of, of March, probably that first few weeks, first, uh, second week I would say, as I was visiting with my staff, I felt like it was important. We did had no clue how deep, we still don't know exactly how deep, how wide uh, this downturn is with, from the double impact of both lower oil prices and and the pandemic that we're all having to uh, have social distancing and, and shutting down large parts of the economy, what long-term impact that'll have, much less the immediate short-term impact it'll have. But quickly, we started looking at prior events here in Texas to try to begin to get some data as to what this may mean, looking at the great financial crisis when we had that downturn, also looking at 9-11, a few other examples, because uh, just from a data perspective, come on in, sweetie. Sorry, wave my uh, Julia. Say hello to everybody in Lubbock. There we go. So uh, Julia, I was just, uh, she, I assume she's got schoolwork to do. So as we were talking about this with everybody on, on the call before we got in, that uh, you know we're all finding a spot somewhere in our house to do schoolwork and work at the same time, but we all, we're like everybody, we're making it work. But we went back and we were looking at a lot of prior events to try to begin to extrapolate what this may mean quickly on, I felt like I needed to get out and start talking about that we felt like, at least in Texas, we didn't know how long, but this was going to cause some type of uh, mild recession at minimum, not just in the U.S., but here in Texas. Uh, say, for example, you know, once uh, we got into March, obviously a lot of restaurants, uh, whether it's hotels, you know, significant downturns in, in, in unemployment numbers that started to increase. We've seen, obviously, uh, records unfortunately shattered so many lives have been turned upside down if you look at the state revenues i've been asked pretty much over and over is what is this going to do to the current budget cycle and i said very early on i wanted to lay a couple markers down one 
Texas started into this with a very healthy economy. We have a large economic stabilization fund balance or what's called the rainy day uh, fund balance right now that has a little over $10 billion. There's some dollars that were appropriated by the legislature that haven't been drawn down by agencies. Most of those are either to our state supported living centers uh, or dollars that were going in response to Hurricane Harvey for institutions of higher education that were impacted as well as, as uh, different state agencies. So those dollars are yet to be drawn down. We will have some more money that is put into that fund based off of our severance tax collections. And obviously what we estimated would go in there is gonna be a slightly less with these record low numbers that we're seeing in, in, in oil prices. And so therefore, in, in short, we think that when the legislature comes back into session in January, they'll probably have about $8.5 billion in that fund, which gives us a lot of flexibility from a cash flow perspective in the treasury. So, you know, what I keep telling people, I have several people that ask me, do we need to come in a legislative special session? The answer is no. From my vantage point, one, I don't think they're going to agree to anything in, the, in a short 30-day session. Number two, they don't need to be together because of social distancing. And number three, most importantly, the state can cash flow. I've been on calls with many other treasurers. We're on a weekly call, if not, if not more. And, you know, the situation in other states is, is, is much more severe because they're trying to figure out how do they cash flow during this time period where Texas is able to. But it is going to have a significant impact. I've said, you know, also that I will give a revised revenue estimate later this summer, probably in July. And people, I had a state senator call me just the other day and said, Glenn, why are you waiting till July? And the simple answer is the collections that we are having right now on, on the 20th of this month of April, those are for the sales tax collections that came in during the month of March. And as you recall, we really didn't go to social distancing in Texas until around the 14th of of March. So therefore, what I'm collecting this month really only gives a part snapshot into what started to begin to happen in the economy last month. So the collections that are occurring right now in April will come in starting in May the 20th, running through the rest of that month. And so therefore, that'll give us a little bit better glimpse. And I would really like to make sure that we have at least a foundational level of, of better data to be able to say what we think is happening here immediately. And, and how that impacts the current biennium budget, which runs through, as you may recall, through August of next year. I had a legislator text me the other day and said, what is this going to impact to the budget next cycle? Well, first I said, I've got to be able to figure out what is this doing to this current budget, because that is the base for the estimate that I will give the legislature in January of next year. And so until we get some real good data, I don't want to be putting a back of the envelope revenue number out there. However, we do know that it will be adjusted downward in the terms of billions of dollars. But with that, having perspective that the state budget on a given year with our federal and our state dollars, about one third is federal dollars, two thirds is state dollars, it's about $126 billion. And the reason I talk a lot about sales tax over and over again, even though local entities may talk about more about property taxes and sales taxes, at least in the state of Texas, of the two thirds portion that is state money, Obviously, tax collections is the largest portion of that, and roughly about 57% of all tax collections are sales tax, and another 8% is motor vehicles and sales taxes, and so therefore, that's the reason I talk about that the most, because that determines the health of the state treasury more than any other tax that we have come in, even though they're all important, but that one's the most important. So, so with that, why don't I stop there? I know we have some questions and then we'll just kind of break up kind of the flow and go through some of the questions and then happy to answer questions after we get through the, the pre-set questions y'all have. Absolutely. And I'd like to remind um, everyone to type your questions. Uh, if you were not able to pre-submit questions, please type them in the Zoom app chat function and we will try to get to those. Um, I'm going to start, you had just mentioned uh, the rainy day fund and the state budget. And we have a question submitted about uh, potentially accessing the rainy day fund um, or any other manner of supporting local governments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you if you look at right now, my staff, we're working uh, pretty hand in hand with the governor's office, Texas Department of Emergency Management. There's a couple of different ways that, that we can get immediate money potentially to to local governments. But we're trying to get a lot more guidance out of the federal government and the Treasury is that I think it was bill number three that Congress passed, the CARES Act, was providing $11.2 billion to the state of Texas. Now, if you were a certain size and above of a local government, you could apply straight to the Treasury to get dollars. 
there was only 18 entities that were of that size or, or above. So they had to provide that last week. Texas had already received half of the money we were supposed to get, part of the guidance that we were trying to, to continue to get. Treasury gave out a little bit of guidance yesterday because originally they had said, and they really confirmed yesterday, but hopefully we can get even more guidance, that those dollars can only be used for COVID-type response. And so therefore, the, the hope from local governments in most states, at least most of the states that I'm talking to, was those dollars could be used in a much more broader fashion for even revenue decreases for local governments and state governments for cash flow perspective. So we're still trying to work through the mechanics of that. If, it, if you look at the state rainy day fund, the dollars can be appropriated out of that by a two thirds vote in both the House and the Senate. And so the point being is there, there's nothing that could be done out of that fund immediately because the legislature is not in session. They didn't appropriate any money because no one foresaw an event like this. And so therefore, obviously, until they're able to get back into session, there is really questions on how we're going to be able to do to do something like out of the rainy day fund or either or other other type of revenues that would come into the straight. And then lastly, there is the uh, municipal uh, program, the MLF that that the uh, Fed is has announced. And so therefore, an entity, either Texas and or local governments could go and based off 2017 tax revenues, you can get a loan up to 20%. That loan is for two years. Uh, we're working pretty hard internally to figure out how we would be able to administer that. I was on a call with uh, the other treasurers around the nation just yesterday, and all the other states are trying to figure out how they would do something like this as well, because you only entities that were a certain size could go directly to the Fed, and most are not that size. And so therefore, the state would ha essentially have to somehow administer this program. The state is the one that would be liable for it. So the state has a risk of making sure we get paid back. We, we came up with a plan that we think will work, but we've sent that to the attorney general's office. We've sent that to the governor's office. And we've also sent that to our, to our bond council, uh, our lawyers that, that advise us to make sure that at least the proposal we've come up with would work. And then if that works, then we can try to start getting some of those dollars to local governments at least to be able to figure out how they can continue to cash flow if they have issues and make sure to be able to maintain their most important and all of their people on their payroll. Thanks so much for that. Many of us have been around long enough to remember the 2011 session and yeah. uh, those of us who weren't around back then certainly saw what happened with the oil market this week and you mentioned that earlier. We had a question pre-submitted, can you compare proportional impact of oil related revenues to total revenue estimate for upcoming session as compared to the 2011 session? And I know that's hard to still kind of wrap our arms around, yeah. but looking back to 2011, how do you think the next session will compare? Yeah, I went through both the 2003 session, which we had a downturn in the economy. That was the first session I was in the state, state Rep House of Representatives. 2011, I was a state senator. Uh, 2011 was a lot worse than 2003, even though I didn't think 2003 could get any worse, but it was. Uh, personally, just as, as early on, it's really too early to tell exactly. You know, we don't think, a lot of people are talking about what is the recovery gonna look like once we're able to get back to work? Uh, whether this is a V-shaped recovery, U-shaped recovery, which U then means it's longer, you just don't know how much longer before, before it starts to recover. Is it more like a dead? You have a recovery, but then you keep coming back and down because uncertainties as to a lot of things when it comes to the pandemic and being able to contain contain the virus from coming back around either this fall or next spring. And so I've been out saying that we think, at least internally, this is more of a U-shaped recovery than a V-shaped recovery. It's not going to be an immediate quick recovery. But with that being said, um, you know, I would say that in my first instinct is that this upcoming uh, legislative session will be equally as bad, if not worse, than 2011. And, and part of that is because if you look around, it's very different than those prior events that I mentioned, the great financial crisis and or whether it was 9-11. And part of that is because this is a slowdown that is occurring across the entire world. So the entire world is facing a significant number of challenges. And so, you know, while I do know that Texas has gone through some very rough times before, We've always got through it. We have a lot of people in this state that are very, uh, very well focused and want to get back to work and want to make sure there's a future generation, you know, Texas, a strong Texas for future generations. We're going to get through this, but I do believe that, yes, 
next session is it should probably be just as bad. And part of that is is when you lay on top of it, not just the financial issues, but unfortunately, next legislative session is also the every 10 year redistricting. And, and I've been through a couple of those in redistricting and they're just, they're very hard because certain areas of the state lose representation, some areas of the state gain representation. And obviously that's very personal. And so therefore that, that adds just another mix is one reason I would say I think it's worse in part because you're also dealing with redistricting, assuming that we can continue to get all the census data during the time that we're having the social distancing, which is a big question there too. Sort of a related question that we had, um, kind of a follow-up to that, that was a, another question we had submitted in advance was, what, what dedicated funds do you believe, the budget includes a number of dedicated funds um, at the state level, what dedicated funds do you believe might be especially hard hit in this situation, uh, there's you know highway construction, other dedicated funds. Yeah, I think first and foremost, if you look back, say for example, we look back at the uh, Great Financial Crisis, and just to kind of make a point real quick, if you look at uh, hotel stays, you know, right now across the nation, there's roughly about 22% occupancy in in hotels, which is a historic low. If you look at motor vehicle sales tax collections, they're they're pretty well much lower than what we thought they were going to be. They were down for 18 months, roughly about 18% over the course of average of that year and a half. We don't think it'll be quite as long, but it'll be deeper at the beginning and then shallow up a little bit more. Sales tax is, again, the one that I'm really watching. Uh, severance tax collections, I had mentioned several times before, and I mentioned a little bit earlier that we thought the economic stabilization fund would have eight and a half billion when the legislature gets there maybe a little bit more, but I, but I like to be a little more conservative and use a smaller number than a bigger number and hope that maybe it would be a little bit larger. We had anticipated severance tax collections this year that ends in August for us for our, for our fiscal year. We would transfer to the highway department $1.6 billion and an equal amount would go into the state, high, state economic stabilization fund or state savings account. Obviously those numbers are lower. Now I was having lunch with my children the other day and we were having a supply and demand lesson over lunch as we talked about oil prices that were at a dollar eighty-eight and then a dollar thirty-two. Later that afternoon, my ninth grader, my fifteen-year-old, she had asked me. She said, "Dad, what what are oil prices now?" And I said, "Well, right now they're um, before I before I tell you, let me show you the screenshot I took when they were negative thirty-seven dollars." And she looked at me and went, "I." I don't understand that. And interesting every day, like today, as I was having lunch with my kids, they want to know what is West Texas intermediary crude right now. So I never imagined my kids would be asking that question over lunch. But the point is, is that, you know, we will not be 1.6 billion this fall. It'll be slightly less without a doubt. The good thing is we've had several months of collection. So that one will be impacted. It's really hard to say exactly which ones will be impacted. I think they'll all be impacted to some degree. Uh, just the question is how much, and, and that's part of it. We just don't have good data to be able to extrapolate all that out right now. Sir, we had a, a couple of questions that were submitted that have to do with tax policy, and okay. that's probably more in the what, what actually happens with uh, the, the manner of taxation that we have in Texas is probably, it starts with the legislature, but I wanted to go ahead and throw out, throw out there the question. Uh, there was one question submitted about uh, the consideration for further property tax reductions, or uh, would there ever be the possibility of imposing an income tax? And just your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously the legislature every session is, uh, ever since I've, I've started uh, serving in some capacity, we've been talking about property taxes, and I think we're going to continue to talk about it. In part, uh, right now, the demographics are going to change, but across the state of Texas, uh, when, you, when you roughly every day when we wake up and it's just hard to fathom this number, which I challenge people at almost every speech to think about every morning when you wake up in this state, there's roughly another thousand to twelve hundred people every day, every single day in the state of Texas. And so that you may say, well, that's that's not necessarily in Lubbock or the surrounding communities. And I understand that. However, when you're growing that much, that puts a lot of pressure in our property tax system or people wanting to buy properties even in rural areas, which we've seen you know, really increase over the course of the last 10 years. So I think that's one reason the legislature took significant steps last session to put more money into public education, but it's also continued to try to compress property tax rates on, on the ISD side of it. And so therefore, I think that discussion will continue. 
uh, without a doubt. I also think, you know, they continue to talk about the franchise tax. That's not one that is very popular with businesses. Um, even my office that auditors, I have my auditors that say, can't we go back to the old tax? Because it's very difficult, obviously, for us, because it's new and trying to figure it out, even though it's been around for, for, for 10 years or more. But, you know, your question on the income tax, I don't see that happen in the state of Texas. I mean, the fact is, the legislature would have to take a vote to pass a state income tax, both the House, the Senate, the governor, a constitutional amendment. The voters of the state of Texas would have to, uh, to overturn the prohibitions that are in the current constitution. And I just don't think you're gonna have that happen. In part, one of the reasons Texas has been able to continue to grow from an economic perspective is we're just one of a handful of states that don't have an income tax. And so therefore, I think that's one of the reasons that we've been able to grow. And, and what's interesting, I've had a couple of questions from reporters, is this Texas gonna be impacted more severely by the downturn because you're more heavily relying on sales tax as a state than an income tax? And reality is uh, some of the states that are most impacted from a budget standpoint are those on the East and the West Coast in part, why? Because they have a heavy reliance on the income tax and that income tax is not just spread out among everybody, but it's more, much more concentrated at the higher income levels and the higher income levels is on capital gains. And right now in the market, obviously there's not going to be much capital gains. And so therefore the point being from a volatility index, those states actually have a, a greater risk from volatility potentially than Texas does. So, you know, you're not, you're not even, even if you could get it done, it doesn't help the state from a management perspective, and it's just not gonna happen at all. And I think Texas is better off that we don't have one. Thank you for that. So um, when the COVID-19 crisis first started and the social distancing started in Texas, the comptroller's office did put out uh, some small business relief in the form mm -hmm. of sales tax remittance relief, et cetera. What other measures has your office implemented to address this with small businesses? Yeah, real quick, if you don't mind, I'd like to be able to make sure everybody understands kind of what the constraints we've had on on the sales tax is immediately, obviously, a lot of businesses were having uh, significant issues on being able to keep retain their employees cash flow perspectives. So the question became, can you just uh, say for one industry or the other that you don't have to pay your sales tax, which as we all know, sales tax is collected from us, the people held in trust by that business and then remitted the month later to the state of Texas. And then on top of that, I collect the local portion, and there's 1,633 local jurisdictions across the state of Texas that get some form of sales tax. And so therefore, it is equally uh, difficult for me to make a policy that impacts over 1,600 local jurisdictions. So when the governor has a disaster declaration, then we can postpone the timing of the payments of those sales tax for up to 90 days. But again, that has to apply for everybody impacted and so obviously the entire state of Texas is a disasters area. And so we felt like the most prudent way was to encourage businesses to file your paperwork, to file your taxes if you're able to. And then if you're not able to work with us on a case by case basis, and if you have a history that you didn't pay during the good times, you're probably not a very good candidate to be able to have a deferral during this time. But if you've been you know, very timely before, then we'll work with you and we've worked with several businesses and I think we've had about 4,500 uh, payout agreements right now. And so we're also trying to do the same thing with other type of taxes. But again, we're trying to make sure that we do it in a manner that is fair across the board to everybody because what we do not need to be doing is picking winners and losers and treating one industry sector different than another industry sector. Thanks for that. We have a question um, that was also submitted ahead of time. And it has to do with whether the legislature might be uh, looking at and what you know uh, from maybe the direction of thought that's there, uh, whether they might be looking at either passing additional costs down to the local level or uh, maybe redirecting revenues that otherwise, sales tax revenues, for instance, that would be going to the local level uh, if the state is statewide feeling crunch. Yeah, I, you know, obviously I'm not sure what the legislature, what 181 members of the legislature may be thinking. Um, I learned a long time ago, dare in mind any thought that's out there, one of them is gonna have that thought. So, uh, but with that said, I find it pretty hard that the state of Texas would try to actually take a halt and take over 
local government dollars because local governments are going to have very significant potential issues depending on the region, uh, depending on the portion of the state of Texas from from the uh, the issues that we're dealing with right now. So I, I would find it hard to imagine that you know the state would try to to take over some of those dollars from from local communities. Uh, finally, we have one question that was pre-submitted, and uh, we've talked about the oil situation. It seems as though Texas is facing two situations, the COVID-19 situation, and then also, right. of course, right. our West Texas oil industry. What what industries uh, that are maybe related to that could also be, in, it's a secondary, from a secondary impact standpoint to the oil industry, what is the industry that we should be watching that could be uh, that could could also create a significant impact to the state's budget based on what's happening with oil? So, so when we had uh, the kind of slight downturn in in portions of the state economy, not statewide, but in certain regions uh, during the last downturn in oil, which was starting in the fall of 2014 and went through parts of 2015 and 2016, and we saw roughly about 160,000 layoffs during that time period over a 12 month period that crossed 2016 and 17. And those were two principally in one, the mining industry, oil and gas, and number two in the manufacturing industry. And so it was pretty much, I don't wanna say isolated, but those are the two that took the bigger hit. And so earlier this year, we had seen that sales tax receipts from the oil and gas industry had slightly decreased. And so even before these two events hit in March here in Texas, that we had noticed that there was a little bit slowing down of, of activity in the oil industry already. Uh, we had figured that that was coming. And the question was, would that ripple over into the manufacturing industry? And would that ripple over into other industry sectors, say, for example, in the Permian Basin? The Houston area is much more diverse than it used to be, but it's still very heavy oil. Uh, during that time, during 16 and, uh, and, and 2015, certain areas of the state didn't see that impact. And so therefore my point being now, because oil prices have gone down so drastically and have impacted that industry sector, I think those ripple effects could be further spread out because you know, in the Permian Basin, for example, that's not just gonna hit the oil industry, that's gonna hit every single mom and pop shop that is there in town or in the area. And so you know, this one is gonna be a little bit deeper in that industry, unfortunately, than what it was and will have a little bit wider ripple effect, unfortunately. Sir, I have one last question for you. And we have a lot of people watching live today. And so um, there's some people that have been uh, working from home or that have been uh, staying at home uh, and maybe have a little extra time uh, to uh, do something that I know that you all like to promote. And that is to find their unclaimed uh, yes. treasures, unclaimed funds. Can you talk a little bit about that? And how Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for asking that, Norman. If you didn't ask it, I would have found a way to put it and squeeze it in. Is that uh, my office every year, those items that if you live somewhere and you uh, put a utility deposit down, you moved, you forgot to get your utility deposit, that's your money. If you don't get it back from, from the company, they'll look for you for a few years, they can't find you, then they send it to the state treasurer, i.e. the controller's office. Or if you may have had a last paycheck, a bank account, maybe you had an insurance proceed, maybe you're the heir to a will, now, there's a wide range of different things that, that you may have unclaimed property from. And so I highly suggest everyone go to claimittexas.org. Again, that website is claimittexas.org. You can do a simple search for yourself, uh, do a simple search for, for families, loved ones, uh, those dollars. Uh, if you go online, you put in the application for it. We just want to make sure that you are you. I know it seems hard to believe there may be another person with your exact name, but there is. I know there's another one with Glenn Hager, and that's my dad, so I always got to double check uh, which Glenn Hager is the money. But, you know, just the other day, um, we found some dollars that were for, for relatives of mine. And so I highly encourage, if you look today and you find something, you say, oh, well, I've cleaned it all out. I don't ever have to look again. Well, companies actually continue to turn those dollars into us year after year. And so, therefore, I would highly encourage you to put your reminder in your calendar look every single year. And if I recall offhand in, in Lubbock County, there's over $30 million. Now this isn't like the lottery and one person's going to win it all. So don't think it's a one winner take all, but in fact, the average claimant I think has a little over a thousand dollars. Not everybody has a thousand dollars, but it's an easy process to go through in roughly in about 45 to 60 days. We'll put a check in the mail to you for your, for your property. So I highly encourage everybody to go to claimittexas.org and you'll be able to claim your property. And just, uh, yeah, exactly. So in, in the city of Lubbock, 
There's about 400,000 properties for $31 million in, in Lubbock County. It's a little almost $34 million in unclaimed property that we are waiting for you to come to find us and we can send you your money. Well, I'm not going to keep everyone for too much longer uh, because I know everyone's dying to, uh, to get off the call and maybe go to claimattexas.org. But I want to thank you, Mr. Comptroller, for joining us today. I also want to remind everyone that this week we launched our uh, uh, displaced job resources uh, for displaced workers and small business recovery resource site in this together lbk.com uh, be sure to visit that or send someone that might need some of those resources to that site uh, we certainly encourage you to do that please don't hesitate to reach out to the chamber with any questions concerns or needs that you might have and thanks again to comptroller hager and his staff for helping to make this visit possible today have a good afternoon thank you